I will try to pick up uh, as best I could from two weeks ago to pick up our sermon series, How to Prevent Burnout. Um, and we, uh, we began by looking at the story of the prophet Elijah. Uh, and last week's message, again, uh, by Jody, was right on point, although we didn't plan it. But maybe God needed uh, for our faith community to hear that twice. Um, so we kind of pick up where we left off. And if you remember, we read through the whole story the, the, um, the first week, and then the second week we kind of have given us six steps that we're kind of going through that we find in this story. But we find Elijah in the middle of his own burnout. In one day, in one day, he went from the most important accomplishment in his career to being a wanted man. And not only wanted, but a bounty on his head. So Elijah uh, runs. He runs into the wilderness where no one would dare to go. He, leave his, he leaves his servant and his companion behind because he didn't want to put his or her life in danger. And as he stops, he asks God to take his life. Elijah, like many of us, is at the end of his life. Road. He is amazed and shocked of how quick, quickly life could change on him. And we've been looking at Elijah's life, hoping that we can learn some steps that if we apply them to our own life, we can prevent burnout or it can help us through a season of burnout. To some degree, to some degree, all burnout is, is normal. It's a part of life, and the, the progression through life. Uh, we experience it in our faith, we experience it in our relationships, we experience it in our careers, and even in our service to Christ. In step one, uh, what we said two weeks ago, and I think that was probably instilled last week, was step one is rest. And sometimes you got to sleep on it a little bit. Uh, sometimes you just got to stop and not make a decision to do nothing and, and sit back and rest. And today we're going to look at step two, and that's taking care of of our body. And for today, when I, I use the term body, I'm not just referring to or limiting it to our physical body. I believe that we're a whole being. We're physically, mentally, and, and spiritually uh, correlated and connected uh, vitally. And we're interconnected, and, and what influences one influences the other. And for our body to be in whole, be whole or well, we must realize. There's three compartments to our individuality. And I shouldn't have to convince you. You already know this. If you are sick physically or in pain, it affects your mental and emotional health as well. Stress, which is the mind, causes physical problems. <coughs> high blood pressure and everything else. I have learned this week uh, that warts um, are caused by... A virus. It's not something that you get from frogs. It's actually called by a virus. And when your immune system goes down, the virus activates and you get warts on your hand. Hence the name worry wart. Didn't know that. It's, it's very connected. And then there's a real syndrome. A real syndrome, especially with me, that plays out in our family all the time. And it's called hangry. <laughs> hangry. If I'm really hungry and I don't get something to eat, I get irritated, I get frustrated, and I get angry at the smallest things. Sometimes you just got to feed the baby, and I'll be all right. But body, body, mind, and spirit are vitally, vitally connected. So today when I use the word body or term body, I'm really referring to all three. It's more of an embodiment of who we are as God created us. So it's not just body. So what are some of the causes? What are some of the causes of burnout? One is the expectation of what we envision our life to be compared to the reality of what our life is. It's the expectation of what we envision our life to be compared to the reality of what our life really is. We become our own worst critic. We begin to make a list of things we believe will make our vision of our life our reality. And we've, we talked about that in another sermon, sermon series. But we get, begin to make this list of things uh, like I ought to, or I should, or I have to, or 
Lord, I've got to. And when these things on our list don't happen because life gets in our way, we begin to feel guilty. Look, lists are good. I love lists. Ask my wife. I survive better in my life with a list of things that I have to do. But lists, especially of things I cannot control, should not and cannot dictate my life. And if they do, we all will experience burnout if we live by that same way. The second cause of burnout is what's called emotional reasoning. This happens in faith communities and families all the time. Emotional reasoning is when we begin to listen to our feelings instead of the facts. The, the focus that drives us are not the facts, but our feelings. Recently, in the last two weeks, we took a poll about worship times. The first question we ask is, what time do you believe is more welcoming and inviting to people who do not attend. The first week, the question was about others. Not about yourself, but about others. What time do you think other people would want to worship? The answer were 43 people you believe other people would want to worship at 9 o'clock. 10 people believed that other people wanted to worship at 10 o'clock, and one person believed that other people wanted to worship at 11 o'clock. The next question, last week, and I specifically uh, asked Randy to, to ask it different. It was asking kind of, it was totally different focus. The question was, what time would you, what time would increase your participation? What was best for you? To pretend to, to, to worship. First question was others. Second question for you. When you focused on yourself, 42 of you said 9 o'clock, 13 of you said 10 o'clock, and 0 of you said 11 o'clock. These answers could not be more identical. However, in a national fact, the national survey says all churches across the nation in the United States all say that 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings is by far the best time to worship to get the most participation out of your community. Now, doesn't mean we're going to change worship times. Doesn't mean it's best for us. But the fact is, nationwide across the United States, 10 o'clock. You see, emotional reasoning is I feel it, so therefore it must be true. And we run off emotions and we ignore the unbiased fact. I feel it, so therefore it must be, it has to be true. It happens with worship attendance across all churches all the time. If people in the, in the congregation feel, feel that there's more people here, then, the, then, then they're happier. And they say our attendance is up, everything's great. If they feel less people are here on, on a weekly basis, then they feel the church is going in the wrong direction and, and, and things are hopeless and things like that. But when they, when they also think, well, you know, last year this time we had more people. But if you go back and look at the actual numbers, sometimes they're the same. It's how we feel. We think if we feel it, it's true. It happens all the time. Ask an athlete or a musician after a big game or performance. No matter the outcome, here's what they'll say. I play horrible. I didn't do good, man. I just, I just messed up. And when in fact, if you look at the statistics of their game or, or the performance, it was outstanding. But see, they missed it because they were only focusing on their mistakes and how they felt about their performance. Only listening to your feelings or emotions can distort the truth. So what did Elijah do to recover from burnout? Remember, we can learn a lot from Elijah. What did he do? And if you will turn to me, uh, we read the whole story, but we're going to go back and walk through it. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, beginning with the fifth verse. And let's see what Elijah did to uh, get over his burnout. Verse 5. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. And at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then laid down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey uh, is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, strengthened, 
by, by that food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mouth of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. How do we prevent a step to get out of our mouth? We take care of our body. We take care of our whole body, the whole embodiment of who we are. How? Like Elijah, we need to start by releasing some of our frustrations. We know when, when Elijah goes into the cave, uh, he vocalizes his frustrations to God. You see, revealing your feelings is the very first step in healing. And God knew Elijah was a basket case full of emotion. And God says, Elijah, after you eat and rest, go into the cave and tell me exactly what you are thinking. And so Elijah goes to the cave and he says, God, I am afraid. God, I am bitter. God, I'm angry. God, I'm lonely. God, I'm worried and I'm sad. And no wonder Elijah was burned out. <coughs> and have you ever had those feelings of being afraid, of being bitter, of being angry, of being lonely, of being worried, or just being sad? And here is the amazing thing. God did not say... Elijah, you shouldn't feel that way. He didn't say that. God, listen. God, listen. Look, if you ever, if you are ever the listener, and someone pours out their emotions to you, and someone opens up to you, uh, don't ever tell them how they should feel. Don't ever tell them how they should feel. Learn from God. Never tell them what they should feel. God says, look, I will listen, Elijah. I will listen to you until your words run out. If you, if you go further in the Old Testament, there's a book of Psalms. And if you read through the book of Psalms, basically at King David blowing off steam and unloading his feelings on God. And, and, and sometimes they're, they're, God, you feel so close to me. I love you. you you're the, you're the, the compass of my life. And sometimes David says, God, where are you? I'm mad at you. You're nowhere. Where are you? It's, it's David's emotions. Read through them and you'll see that. And if you're on the verge of burnout, let God know how you feel. Trust me. God can take it. I mean, actually, God welcomes it. Let God know how you feel. Don't hold back. Pour out your heart to God. God doesn't want you to carry this burden and load alone. The next thing we can do is to switch the focus off us and put it on someone or something else. Remember in the sermon series where I shared research showing how recovery from cancer and volunteering uh, and mentoring were connected? We got to focus on something else. My, my brother Robert, many of you know, uh, for 35 years has been a nurse. And two years ago, he moved back to Memphis to take care of our, our mother. And just recently, when the, the hospice nurse came in, she said she had never, in her years of experience, had never seen a family member take as good care or better care of a patient than my brother did our mother. And then she told him this. In us. She says, today, he stopped being her nurse. We will take care of that. You need to be her son. Because she needs her son right now, in this last season of her life, more than she needs a caregiver. Sometimes we can overdo one role in our life and we forget about the other roles we play to other people. I had a mentor tell me one time, the best thing, the very best thing I could do for my children at the end of is to take great care of their mother and father. Because children should not, nor do they have the capacity to worry about the welfare of their parents. We've got to take care of ourselves. We've got to take care of ourselves mentally and emotionally and physically. But before I end or close, I need to add one very important, vital, crucial statement. I need everyone to listen. If you've tuned me out, tune in now, please. Burnout 
is not depression. Burnout is not depression. If you or a loved one has ever battled with depression, you know it is a nightmare. Depression is ruthless to not only the individual, but the family unit as well. Depression needs a clinical diagnosis and a specific long life term, long treatment plan with sometimes a combination of, of therapy and medication. You can prevent, you can prevent or cure yourself of burnout because it's a condition or an atmosphere we create. But depression is not burnout. And if you struggle with depression, and some of these things we discussed might, they might bring some relief, but they will not bring a cure. And if you struggle with depression, please hear me loud and clear. God cares. I care. We care. There are people around you, most of them, all today are being disguised, are battling the exact same thing. And we are a faith community. And beyond anything else, we will love you, we will walk with you, and we will be there for you. Burnout can mirror depression. But it's not depression. So God has a, a wholeness plan for us. For all of us. And it's simple, uh, but it's hard to execute. God says first, eat, sleep, and rest. We cannot burn a candle at both, sleep, both ends and, and expect to survive very long. God says emotional release, unplug, and, and, and God says, tell me how you really feel. No holds barred. Third, he says, focus on Jesus. Look, God is God. We are not. Let go of the list of things that we can't control in our life. And last, he says, get involved. Begin to help someone else. These four things work. I mean, they're in the Bible. And they have worked for a very, very, very long time. And they can have the potential to prevent or help us recover from burnout. Normally, pray. I'm going to pray, but I want you to, to pray with me today. Just a little bit different. I want you to close your eyes or look up or however you feel most comfortable with God and just repeat that to me. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, you know how tired I am. You know how frazzled my emotions are. You know how often I feel like I can't make it. I need your help. I need you to restore my soul. Today I'm surrendering the control of every area of my life to you. Today I'm surrendering the control of every area of my life to you. I'm going to follow your direction. Even when it doesn't make sense. Even when it doesn't make sense. I recognize you are God. I recognize you are God. And I am not. I am not. Help me to take action. On these two steps this week. On these two steps this week. Help me to get the rest I need. Help me to get the rest I need. Help me to spend time with you. Help me to spend time with you. Every day reading your word. Every day reading your word. And talking to you about my feelings and frustrations. And talking to you about my feelings and frustrations. Help me to stay focused. Help me to stay focused. And centered on you. And centered on you. Help me to meet someone. Help me to meet someone. Where I can receive support. Where I can receive support. Help me to give my life away. Help me to give my life away. And serving your children. Serving your children. In your name I pray. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen.